Dear students, welcome to the chapter on osmoregulation and excretion. What is excretion? It is the elimination of metabolic waste from the body, especially the nitrogenous waste through organs such as kidneys, skin, lungs, etc. The elimination of carbon dioxide takes place through the lungs, that is why it is mentioned here. But mainly it is the elimination of nitrogenous waste, especially the uh, in our case it is the elimination of urine. The process of urination is a part of excretion. Now what is osmoregulation? Osmoregulation is the maintenance of a constant osmotic environment inside the body. So what we will just take it through an example. Here you have three conditions in which we will come to this one where you have a cell which is kept in a solution. There is solution inside the cell. You can call it as the cell sap or the protoplasm or whatever it is and there is a solution outside. Suppose the solute concentration inside the cell as well as outside is the same. The water will move in and out of the cell at an equal rate. There will be exchange of water but the movement will be at the same rate. So here the solution around the cell is isotonic that means it is having the same solute concentration as that of the fluid inside the cell. Now we will come to another solution that is hypertonic solution that means the concentration of the solution outside the cell is higher. In that case what will happen? So here the concentration of solute is higher. So in this case water will move out of the cell by osmosis and which will lead to the shrinkage of the cell because the cell is hypotonic compared to the outer solution which is hypertonic. So there will be loss of water. Now we come to a third case where the solution outside the cell is having a lower solute concentration or it is hypotonic. The cell here is hypertonic and the solution around is hypotonic. In that case water will move into the cell by osmosis. Sometimes it will cause it to burst. So this is the case of a cell if it is in different types of solutions. If it is in an isotonic solution there will be no problem. So similar situation is faced by organisms mainly who live in water, who live in an aquatic environment. Organisms which live in an aquatic environment will be facing such problems. You take the case of a marine organism. In the marine environment is highly concentrated. It is having high salinity. But the body fluids of organisms will be mostly having lower salinity as that of the surrounding seawater. So what risk or challenge will they face? The surrounding seawater is hypertonic. So there is risk of losing water and there is even risk of gaining salts if the surfaces are permeable. If they have got permeable surfaces in their body, there will be entry of excess salts into their body and there will be loss of water. Now you take an organism which lives in a freshwater environment. There the outer environment or the external environment is hypotonic in comparison with their body fluids which is hypertonic. So what will be the risk? The external environment is hypotonic. So there will be excess water gain and they will even lose salts through their permeable surfaces. So this is to be counterbalanced. That process is called as osmoregulation. So the problem of osmoregulation is mainly faced by aquatic organisms even though there is osmoregulation in terrestrial organisms. You take our case. The In our blood, our pl uh, blood plasma maintains a constant concentration, constant osmotic concentration. Why? You, we will just have an example. Uh, we will just uh, have a comparison of our rate of urination on rainy days as well as hot days. On rainy days, we will be having more tendency to urinate. That means we are getting rid of excess water from the body because we are not sweating on a rainy day. Whereas on a hot day, we will be sweating, we are losing water and we have to compensate it through drinking water. 
ഓക്കെ ബട്ട് ഓൺ എ റെയിനി ഡേ വി വിൽ ആർ സ്വെറ്റിംഗ് ഇസ് വെരി ലെസ് സോ ആൻഡ് സപ്പോസ് വി ആർ ഡ്രിങ്കിങ് ലോട്ട് ഓഫ് വാട്ടർ ദർ വിൽ ബി എക്സസ് വാട്ടർ ഇൻ അവർ ബോഡി സോ ഹൗ ഡു വി ഗെറ്റ് റിഡ് ഓഫ് ദിസ് ത്രൂ യൂറിനേഷൻ സോ ദർ വാട്ട് വി ആർ ഡൂയിങ് വി ആർ ഒസ്മോ റെഗുലേറ്റിംഗ് അലോങ് വിത്ത് എക്സ്ക്രീറ്റിംഗ് ബിക്കോസ് യൂറിനേഷൻ ഇസ് അവർ എക്സ്ക്രീറ്ററി പ്രോസസ് ബട്ട് വി ക്യാരി ഔട്ട് ഒസ്മോ റെഗുലേഷൻ അലോങ് വിത്ത് യൂറിനേഷൻ ദാറ്റ് ഇസ് വൈ ഇൻ മോസ്റ്റ് ഓഫ് ദി ഓർഗാനിസംസ് ദി പ്രോസസ്സസ് ഒസ്മോ റെഗുലേഷൻ ആൻഡ് എക്സ്ക്രീഷൻ ഗോ ഹാൻഡ് ഇൻ ഹാൻഡ് എക്സ്ക്രീഷൻ ഇസ് എൻ എൻറ്റിയർലി ഡിഫറെൻറ്റ് പ്രോസസ് വേർ നൈറ്റജീനസ് വേസ് ആർ എലിമിനേറ്റഡ് ഒസ്മോ റെഗുലേഷൻ ഇസ് അനദർ പ്രോസസ് വേർ ദി കോൺസെൻട്രേഷൻ ഓഫ് ദ ബോഡി ഫ്ലൂയിഡ്സ് ഇസ് കെപ്റ്റ് എ കോൺസ്റ്റൻറ്റ് but in most of the organisms these two processes go together you take the case of ammonotelic excretion ureotelic excretion uricotelic excretion etc in all these processes the amount of water that goes out is a matter of concern that is why terrestrial organisms that is why the desert organisms the birds reptiles etc they resort to uricotelism because they eliminate uric acid so that they will spend only less amount of water so there you can see that along with excretion they are also carrying out their osmoregulation so this is how excretion is associated with osmoregulation so at present we will go to osmoregulation only so according to hober in 1902 as he proposed osmoregulation is the maintenance of a constant osmotic pressure in the body fluids of an organism by the control of water and salt concentrations so both ways that means uh, there occurs the control of water as well as the amount of salt in our body that means we are taking care of water loss and water gain as well as salt loss and salt gain so in osmoregulation there are two processes which are simultaneously taking place that is the control of water which is called as osmotic regulation and the control of ions which is called as ionic regulation so this is very important homeostasis what do you mean by homeostasis it is the maintenance of a constant internal environment of the body fluids that is called as homeostasis for example the uh, concentration of a blood plasma is 300 milli osmol per liter it is always the same that is what is called as osmoregulation so how does osmoregulation take place it takes place by the diffusion of water or solutes that means Uh, in if we take the case of uh, aquatic organisms there will be diffusion of water in and out as well as diffusion of solutes in and out of the body so osmoregulation is mainly a problem that aquatic organisms face though it is there in terrestrial organisms also but it is of more concern in aquatic organisms and uh, when there is osmotic when there is osmotic balance when there is a balance struck uh, in osmotic balance there will be optimum concentration of electrolytes and non electrolytes inside the cell body tissue and the interstitial fluid so that they will all work properly so for the proper working of a cell or a tissue there should be a balanced concentration of electrolytes non electrolytes etc not only inside the cell but the space outside the cell which is called as interstitial fluid so in all these places we are required to maintain a constant osmotic pressure or osmotic balance should be there and uh, so what type of organisms are called as osmoregulators those organisms which by any means maintain a constant osmotic pressure of their body fluids are called as osmoregulators so what does that mean there are some animals who cannot do it they are called as osmo conformers so those who regulate their body fluid osmolarity are osmoregulators those who cannot do it are osmo conformers so we will first restrict our study to osmoregulators and then we will go to osmo conformers all the terrestrial vertebrates including us most of the freshwater invertebrates who are having permeable body walls you can even take the example of amoeba a few marine vertebrates example the salmon fish they are all osmo regulators so the examples of osmo regulators are all the terrestrial vertebrates most of the freshwater invertebrates a few marine vertebrates etc then now how is this regulation achieved how do they have a 
regulation of their body fluids. So you take the case of an aquatic organism. In aquatic organism, one of the methods is by adjusting the permeability of the body surfaces or the respiratory surfaces to ions and water. As I already told you, a fish living in marine environment has a threat of losing water. So it has to somehow gain water. And it also has a risk of gaining salts. So it has to lose salts. Okay, all this is possible through the permeable body surfaces such as the skin, gills, etc. So that is one thing. So by adjusting the permeability of the body surfaces or the respiratory surfaces, uh, they will uh, regulate the entry and exit of ions and water. Second thing is the rate of drinking water. As I told you, you will be drinking more water on a hot day where you sweat more. Whereas you will not have that much uh, thirst on a rainy day. So that is one method of osmoregulation. The rate of by adjusting the rate of drinking water. Then again, uh, so this is a uh, somewhat a voluntary mechanism taking in water. Okay. But the thirst is generated involuntary, but uh, water drinking is a voluntary mechanism. Now another one is, uh, when we have food, there will be absorption of water, ions, etc. in the intestine, in the esophagus, etc. But it is not always taking place in the same rate. It depends upon the bodily requirements. So there is absorption of ions as well as water in different parts of our alimentary canal, but the rate differs depending upon the needs of our body. So that is also a mechanism of regulation. Then, when urine is formed in the kidney, there is reabsorption of ions, reabsorption of water, etc. taking place. Because the urine formation takes place in the kidney and in the kidney there are nephrons and in the nephrons there are various parts such as the proximal convoluted tubule, the Henle's loop, the distal convoluted tubule, collecting duct, etc. In all these places, there is absorption of ions, solutes, water, etc. And uh, there is always uh, also the secretion of these things and the rate is different according to the bodily requirements. So, by regulating the absorption or secretion of water, ions, etc. in different parts of the kidney and by also regulating the amount of water absorbed in the urinary bladder, we are osmoregulating. So, os osmoregulation is not a monopoly of aquatic organisms. It is also there in the terrestrial organisms but the threat is more faced by aquatic organisms. So these are the various mechanisms by which osmoregulation is achieved in different types of organisms. Now we will go to the various structures and organs which are involved in osmoregulation. The examples are skin, then gills, the digestive tract, the cloaca, the kidneys, the urinary bladder. Cloaca is in some organisms, you take the case of amphibians, reptiles, etc. There will be a common chamber where urine, feces, gametes, etc. will be collected. That is called as cloaca. So, in all these places, that means the cloaca, the bladder, the digestive tract, etc. There will be absorption and secretion of ions, water, etc. That is what is mentioned here. The formation of urine in the kidney then the loss of water, ions, etc. through the skin, gills, etc. So, all these structures are in some way or other involved in osmoregulation. So, we first go to a freshwater environment. In a freshwater environment, an amphibian or a reptile is hyperosmotic. That means, the body fluid of the amphibian, the body fluid of the organism is having a higher concentration is having a higher solute concentration compared to the surrounding water. So, if it is not regulated, what will happen? Water will move in from the surrounding fresh water. The cells will swell and there is possibility of bursting and the ions become too dilute. So, that will become difficult for the cells to perform. So, these are the risks they face. That means, an organism living in fresh water is having a hyperosmotic body fluid compared to the surrounding fresh water. So, it is facing the risk of gaining excess water, cell swelling, bursting, etc. and also the loss of ions. And the, whatever ions are present inside the body, they become dilute. So, how can this be avoided? By decreasing the permeability of the skin. 
to water and they can also increase the urinary output by increasing urinary output excess water can be eliminated but through this urine it should not lose salts that also should be taken care of and the permeability of the skin to water can be reduced so that water gain will be decreased so this is only a general concept about osmoregulation in a freshwater environment different organisms are having different types of mechanisms now you take a marine or a brackish water species brackish water is that area which is connecting river to the sea in those organisms the surrounding water is hyperosmotic whereas their body fluids are hypoosmotic the body fluids are hypoosmotic in comparison to the surrounding environment so what are the risks they face there will be loss of water if it is unregulated water will move out there will be dehydration and there will be excess concentration of the body fluids the body fluid concentration rises up in which the cells won't function properly they will face dehydration so how can this be circumvented how can the problem be faced by uh, decreasing the permeability of the skin that means either to prevent water loss or to uh, prevent the gain of salts salts shouldn't come in so by decreasing the permeability of the body surfaces to salts so that salts won't come in and second is the reducing the amount of water in urine but taking care that nitrogenous wastes are removed so reducing water loss so this is only a generalized concept about how a freshwater organism and a marine organism regulates the body fluid osmolarity we will just go to a diagrammatic representation where you can see a fish in a freshwater environment how it carries out osmoregulation we will have a generalized concept so it is living in freshwater environment the surrounding water is hypotonic or hyposmotic so what are the the risks they face we'll see so in blue you can see the movement of water is being denoted and in red the movement of ions is denoted so blue indicates water movement and red indicates the movement of ions so they are living in a fresh water environment so there is chance of excess water entering through the skin and uh, the loss of salts loss of ions to the surrounding water so water gain and salt loss but this doesn't take place uh, this is uh, not a considerably high threat because the body is covered with scales so it is one of the mechanisms which will prevent all these threats but still there can be water gain and salt loss so how do they compensate it one is they will be drinking little water or they will not even be drinking water so the excess water entered can be got rid of and they excrete dilute urine so the excess water entry can thus be concentrated by minimizing drinking water and by excreting dilute urine so that is one now how can the salt loss if any be compensated so here there is the uh, the rectal surfaces or the cloacal surfaces through which also the salt can be lost but how do they compensate it they have gills in which there are cells which actively take up ions that means through active transport by the expenditure of energy cells in the gills can take up ions so this will compensate for the loss of ions to the surrounding water so this is what happens in a fresh water environment so if there is water gain that is being concentrated i mean compensated by eliminating excess dilute urine and by preventing drinking of water or minimizing water drinking and if there is loss of ions that is compensated by actively taking up ions through the gills 
now we come to a salt water environment that means the uh, organism is living in a marine environment it is living in a hyper osmotic environment where the threats are water loss you can see water loss through the permeable surfaces there will be water loss so what do they do they will drink ample water and they excrete concentrated urine so they excrete concentrated urine minimizing water loss and they drink water but the problem is when they drink water they are gaining salts also because what they drink is sea water it is having excess salts and even salts can enter through the permeable surfaces of the body so they how do they compensate it there are specialized cells in the gills which can excrete ions actively by the expenditure of energy okay so there are cells in the gills which by spending atp or any source of energy they will be able to eliminate excess salt and they are also eliminating concentrated urine by maximizing the uh, amount of uh, salts in urine that means in excess na plus k plus cl minus etc will be got rid of through eliminating concentrated urine so by that the water loss is also compensated so this is how these organisms who live in freshwater environment and marine environment carry out osmoregulation now we come to certain special cases such as the marine cartilaginous fishes like the sharks rays etc they have got their own pattern of carrying out osmoregulation so how do they tolerate the salt concentration of the surrounding environment because they are marine fishes they are living in a saline environment in a hyperosmotic environment so one thing is these organisms are found to accumulate urea urea is a waste but still they conserve some amount of urea in their body through the kidney because the kidneys can reabsorb some amount of urea so what is uh, expected to be a waste is to be removed and urea is a waste but still these organisms what they do is they will retain some amount of urea in their body through reabsorption in the kidney so the kidney can reabsorb some amount of urea even though it is meant for elimination urea is a waste but the kidneys for elim won't eliminate the whole amount of urea but it will accumulate some amount of urea it will reabsorb or retain some amount of urea and what is this urea retained for urea is a solute so when urea is retained in the body it will act like a solute and it will maintain the solute concentration of their body tissues and by this the body tissues become at a higher concentration compared to the surrounding medium so there will be net inflow of water by osmosis so this will result in the net inflow of water by osmosis so in organisms like shark ray etc which live in a marine environment they have the ability to reabsorb urea and retain urea in the body in a higher concentration so that their body tissues become hyperosmotic to the surrounding medium resulting in a net inflow of water by osmosis another thing is they have got kidneys for osmoregulation so excess salt is excreted by the kidneys that is another method so one is retention of urea which will act like a solute which will add to the uh, osmo uh, add to the osmotic concentration of their body fluids thereby preventing water loss at least they can prevent water loss even if they cannot take up water they will be able to prevent water loss because they are maintaining urea as a solute in their body fluids second is so when they are keeping up solute they are keeping up water also if there is solute present in a region there will be retention of water also so that is why they are keeping urea in our blood also there is some amount of urea retained for this purpose so as to maintain our body fluid concentration in sharks rays etc this is very prominent this mechanism is very prominent that means they are keeping some amount of urea in their body fluids itself so that the body fluid concentration is maintained so that they are not losing water second is excess salt in their body is eliminated by the kidney and in most of the species 
there will be rectal gland near the rectum rectum is the last part of the digestive system and there there will be rectal glands they are also able to eliminate excess salt so excess salt is eliminated by the kidney as well as through the rectal glands which can eliminate excess salt from the body fluids so all these are mechanisms these two are mechanisms by which they are getting rid of excess salt now in marine snakes they have got salivary glands which are the sublingual glands beneath their tongue beneath the tongue there will be salivary glands which are called as the salivary sublingual glands they help in getting rid of excess salts thereby they are attaining a normal blood concentration now there are some reptiles snakes marine birds etc they will ingest sea water so they will uh, compensate for their thirst and take in a lot of salt in their food so to control the concentration of salts and water they possess glands in their heads which will undertake the excretion of excess salt because they cannot live without drinking water they will drink water the reptiles snakes marine birds etc drink water from the surrounding sea but this water is having excess salt but that salt will be eliminated through uh, glands in their heads and uh, the kidneys etc so to the control the concentration of excess salt which is getting in through the ingested water they will possess glands they possess glands in their heads which will carry out the excretion of excess salts from their blood plasma so this is all what is called as osmoregulation so there are several mechanisms by which organisms take up osmoregulation so here we had more of our studies on aquatic organisms now we will go to the osmoconformers so osmoconformers are organisms that maintain an internal environment which is isotonic to their external environment that means when the osmolarity of the external environment changes their body fluid osmolarity also changes so they are conforming with the external environment they cannot regulate they cannot keep a constant osmotic environment inside their body what do the osmoregulators do whatever be the concentration outside they are maintaining a constant osmotic concentration inside their body who the osmoregulators so what do the osmoregulators do whatever be the surrounding osmolarity even if it is sea water even if it is fresh water their body fluid concentration will remain the same whereas in osmoconformers this is not possible they have no regulatory mechanisms so when the surrounding osmolarity changes their body fluid osmolarity also changes so somewhat they keep their so somewhat their internal environment is isotonic to the external environment but this is not a very easy method to live because when it is very high when the surrounding osmolarity increases to a higher level they may not be able to survive they will die that is the problem of being an osmoconformer being an osmoregulator is expensive but risk is low but being an osmoconformer is economic but risk is high so in those organisms the osmotic pressure of the organism cells is equal to the osmotic pressure of the surrounding environment why because they are not able to regulate when the surrounding osmolarity changes their body fluid osmolarity also changes so the osmotic gradient or the difference in concentration will be low the osmotic gradient will be low so the influx and efflux of water will be less the net influx of water and efflux of water into and out of the cells will be less and even though the osmoconformers have an internal environment which is isosmotic to the external environment the types of ions in the two environments are different the concentrations are same but the solutes they have is different that means you the surrounding water the concentration of the surrounding water as well as the concentration of the body fluids is the same only the concentration the value is the same but what ions and solutes they keep is different they cannot survive on the surrounding water their body fluid is different and the surrounding water is different but the concentration is the same in both what solutes are there in their body fluids are different from the solutes in the surrounding medium because whatever solutes they have is to be kept up then only the cells will function properly so we can say 
the concentration of the body fluid is equal to the concentration of the surrounding water we cannot say the body fluid is same as surrounding water it is different but the concentrations are the same because they cannot regulate so it is energetically very economical they need not spend energy for osmo regulation but it is very risky life is very risky so the advantage is that they need not expend as much energy as osmo regulators in order to regulate the ion gradients however to ensure that they are having the correct type of ions in the desired location they have to spend a small amount of energy i told you they, they are not much worried about the concentration but they have to maintain what type of solute is there in their body they cannot lose their own solute to the surrounding medium so that is all, uh, to be kept in uh, balance so they have to ensure that the solute whatever solutes they have is the same in their body in the desired location so for that they may be spending some amount of energy but they are not spending energy for regulating but what is the disadvantage when the surrounding environment osmolarity becomes high their body fluid osmolarity also shoots up which may even lead to a threat in their survival now what are the examples of osmo confirmers hagfish hagfish is a vertebrate its a uh, species its genus name is mixine hagfish is the only vertebrate osmo confirmer the only vertebrate osmo confirmer is hagfish now most of the marine invertebrates the cartilaginous fishes etc are examples of osmo confirmers so, now now we had a discussion on the difference between osmo regulators and osmo confirmers now we will go to another terminology which is much related to this that is urihalinity and stenohalinity or the organisms can be considered urihaline and stenohaline so what is the difference first we go to urihaline those organisms which are tolerant to a wide range of salinity are said to be urihaline that means you take the organism which is living in a brackish water brackish water environments are those areas where the river meets the sea so there will be fluctuations in the salinity of water but still they tolerate those changes so these organisms spend part of their the, uh, there are some organisms who live in brackish water so they are mostly urihaline there are some organisms who are migratory in habit they spend part of their life cycle in fresh water and part in sea water you take the case of salmon and lamprey which are originally sea dwellers but for reproductive purposes they come to fresh water that is their migratory behavior so such migration from sea to river is called anadromous so salmon lamprey etc are anadromous then eel eriochere eriochere is wool handed crab they are all catadromous that means their original home is fresh water but they will go to the sea for reproductive purposes that means they are switching in between their habitats in their life cycle so a part of life cycle is spent in fresh water and a part of life cycle is spent in highly saline marine water so how do they cope up they are able to they can tolerate a wide range of salinity such organisms are said to be urihaline so when they are in fresh water their skin absorbs water that means there is a threat of uh, water gain so how do they compensate they do not drink much water because they are already gaining water through the skin so to uh, so uh, to avoid this uh, or uh, to avoid the excess uh, presence of water they avoid drinking water and they also uh, balance electrolytes by passing dilute urine and they are also able to take up salts through the gills actively this has been discussed earlier now when they move to a hypertonic marine environment you take the case of the salmon fish when the salmon fish when they are in a sea they will lose water there is threat of losing water but and there is gain of uh, if they lose water what will happen there will be excess concentration of salts in their body so they compensate it by excreting the excess salt through their gills and urine so these mechanisms were already discussed but what i was trying to convey is that 
they have to resort to two types of mechanisms the salmon has a part of life cycle in fresh water and in the sea so they have to switch over between the mechanisms also the mechanism which they used in fresh water won't work in the sea so they have to just switch over to another mechanism in fresh water they don't drink water they will pass dilute urine they will take up salts through the gill but in sea water they are excreting salts through the gill so they are switching over between their mechanisms also all this is for tolerating the salinity changes but they are tolerant such organisms are said to be urihaline now what are stenohaline organisms they can tolerate only a very narrow range of salinity they are very sensitive to salinity changes such an organism suppose a stenohaline organism living in the sea suppose it is put to fresh water it will die take a stenohaline organism living in fresh water into sea water it will die that is said to be that is called stenohalinity that means about 90 percentage of the body fish species can live in either fresh water or sea water but not both that means they are all stenohaline 90 percentage of the body fish species are stenohaline that means they cannot switch over so easily between fresh water and sea water as the salmon does so these fish are incapable of osmotic regulation in the alternate habitat take the case of goldfish haddock etc they are very sensitive to salinity changes so this finishes our discussion on osmoregulators osmoconfirmers urihaline and stenohaline organisms thank you